Well, hello and welcome, everybody. And hi, John. We're here at your space, finally. Yeah. The famous Beggar's Table Church and Gallery. And since we're uh, kind of in your space now, you know what that means. That means I get to bat first. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. That's how it works. Sounds good. You're the uh, guest. I miss baseball. I know, I do too. <laughs> and we won't get into it. <laughs> But welcome, and uh, we are continuing our conversation, uh, words to build a life on. That's what Jesus called the words that he spoke uh, that get collected into what's called the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 8, words mm -hmm. to build a life on. And we've been exploring the introduction to that Sermon on the Mount, which is uh, a section known as the Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what number we're on now. Do you? Gosh, I like Six, maybe? I lost track of yeah, numbers, I did too. but I would I add as a caveat, like if you have not yet watched these videos or listened to the podcast audios, you need to backtrack and listen to these things because yeah. I think, and yeah. I, I know it's self-congratulating to say mm -hmm. they're really awesome, but I just think that this is quality uh, teaching, a great opportunity for you to engage. Yeah. 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 I, I hope so. It is for me. And mm -hmm. that's why I, I think this is worth sharing with other people right. as we're grappling with this. Yeah. Uh, once again, yeah. it's a good place to be. So let's get at it, man. Okay. Uh, this week is a, is a beatitude that I think is one that is widely misunderstood and misapplied, mm -hmm. or at least it has been in my own life <laughs> yeah. and tradition. In some ways, it might be one of the most ambiguous initially of oh. the beatitudes, I think. Okay. Easy to say, easy to memorize, but hard to really stop and go, what yeah. did I just say? What does okay. that mean? You know what I mean? I do. I <laughs> yeah. do. I, I do. Yeah. It's, conf it's confusing because of the language, and mm -hmm. it's going to take a little bit of work mm -hmm. to figure out what Jesus is saying. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. I love this beatitude because uh, of the language. Uh, it's, it's blessed are the pure in heart, mm -hmm. for they will see God. And, and again, I'm just take a moment with that. Blessed yeah. are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And um, I love that language. And one of the reasons I love it is because it has to do with the topic of seeing God. Mm. Um, and, and, and there's an insinuation here that not everyone sees God. You know, there, there's a certain kind of person who can see God. And I love that conversation. Because yeah. it, it reminds me of the, the Jewish Talmud that says, we do not see things as they, they are. Mm -hmm. We see things as we are. In other words, the way that we see mm -hmm. things reads more about ourselves and about who we are than the thing itself. Yeah. I always tell my congregation, you know, if you, if, if, if you watch The Godfather... There's nothing that you can say that's going to make that movie not good. The only thing on trial is your ability yeah. to recognize and appreciate quality. <laughs> you know, it will, it will read so, you. It will read you. Yeah. That's so good. Mm -hmm. I've always told the story, and I think I heard it probably when I was young, and so it made an impression up on me. Uh, I heard the story of a young couple going through the the Louvre in, in Paris, where the Mona Lisa is sure. the main attraction. Have you ever been there? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah, me either. That's, that's a bucket list thing there. Yeah. Okay, me too. Uh, you have to remember, I'm a poor pastor. Right. <laughs> Church planter at I, that. I forgot. Yeah. Um, so there, this story of the, uh, is just somebody observing this young couple who, who wait in line and go wind all the way through the museum and they get they finally get up and have their moment looking at the Mona Lisa which is mm -hmm. really the most famous painting in history sure. know, whether or not it should be it's it's it's, arguably. it's just mm -hmm. uh, most copied uh, I mean if it's if you're going to show a, a piece of art in a cartoon to represent art it's going to be the Mona Lisa <laughs> there you go right yeah. that's how you know <laughs> that's how I know uh, and so they get up to it and they're like they're crestfallen they're disappointed they're like well this this isn't that big a deal i mean she's not even that pretty by today's standards and the whole thing that whole story gets flipped to say hey look uh mona lisa is not on trial here when you view the mona lisa 
you're on trial. You're on trial. Right? Because it's already a given. Yeah. All art experts, all of history tells us this is, you know, quintessential yeah. piece of art. Yeah. So you're there to see, to test yourself whether or not you can recognize yeah. uh, how good it is. Yeah. That's a great story. And I think that there is something true about that in Scripture, too. I think that hmm. one of the beautiful things about Scripture is that the way that we see it, hmm. the way that we read it, often tells more about who we are and where we are in our spiritual journey yeah. than it does, you know, act as any kind of critique on Scripture. Yeah. You know, does that make sense? I think so. Yeah. I like the Godfather better, though. <laughs> yeah. Stay with that. Um, so, I, I mean, I really believe that seeing God is not just a given. I mean, one person can see a sunrise and one person sees God in mm -hmm. the sunrise. One person experiences yeah. tragedy and, and just sees nothing but tragedy. Another person will see God in that tragedy. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, even trivial, more trivial things, one person can see a movie and another person will see God in that movie, even though it's not a quote unquote Christian movie, they'll see God in the movie, right. um, in, in art. And I mean, in, and so the question becomes, well, who are the people that are able to see God, to, to, who are able to discern God, mm -hmm. and, and, and what distinguishes them from people who maybe don't see God? It's not that God's not there, they just can't see God. Yeah. Yeah. So what is that? Now, Jesus calls it the pure in heart. Which brings up a heart. whole nother conversation. Right. If you want to get there. If you've well, got more on the scene, no, let's no, do that. No, that's good. I, I, so pure, boy, there's a... Yeah. Um, that word has been misused. Um, yeah. So I would, you know, the, 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 the version of me that doesn't know any better mm -hmm. would approach this beatitude and think, oh, all those people who don't have sex, you know until they're married can see God. <laughs> yeah. And that's pretty much what he's saying. The pure... You grew up in the church, didn't you? The, yeah, I grew yeah. up in the church. Which is not a bad thing. That's a, that's a good... That's good. What, which part of that's not bad? I don't really want to talk about <laughs> <laughs> Something about sex. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say this, that, that certainly what comes to mind when you hear the word pure is uh, immorality, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, or distance from... Uh, things that are immoral. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, That's how we would typically see the pure, yeah. the pure in heart. Yeah. Distance from the world or absence of immorality. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, Jesus blows at least one of those right out of the water uh, because he doesn't keep distance at all from people who would be considered impure by those standards. Right, I was going to ask you what's problematic about that mm -hmm. idea when you start looking yeah. at Jesus' life, and it's because he's hanging out, he spends his time with, yeah. it's not just that he spends his time with quote unquote sinners or the impure, what we might call impure, mm -hmm. I think it's more telling that those people love spending time with him, <laughs> you know, That's so good. they want to be with him. It's certainly true of my life. Yeah. Uh, um, it reminds me of the interactions that Jesus has. I mean, one of, one of the great interlocutors of, of the Gospels is the group known as the Pharisees. Right. Who get a bad rap because, uh, honestly, I don't want to be here defending Pharisees, by the way. But I just want to say, they knew their stuff and they were motivated to, to, uh, to be pure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they wanted everybody else to be. Um, now, what's underneath that, Jesus pokes at and prods at and exposes in so many ways. And there's this passage that happens in John 9 that I wanted to share with you. Okay. Uh, you'll know it because it's where there's this intense encounter going on between Jesus and some of the Pharisees. And there's a, a man who is born blind, mm -hmm. who's going to become uh, just uh, kind of the occasion uh, to have a conversation and to expose motives. Okay. And this is, this is what happens because the Pharisees are like working this poor guy over. And uh, Jesus comes in and meets this guy who's blind and he says, I, I'm the son of man, I'm the long awaited Messiah. And then the man worships Jesus and um, this is after the, the healing, right? And so here's the kicker in, in John 9, 39. Jesus said, for judgment I've come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Mm. So here's this language again of who gets to see. 
And as some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? And they're taking offense. A lot of people taking offense these days. Uh, Jesus said, <laughs> I'm just going to leave that alone. Yeah. Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim that you can see, your guilt remains. Yeah, yeah. That's... Did you, get, you got it there, right? Yeah. For, for Jesus, it's... It's something in the Pharisees, and I think we, what we might label it as pride, that they are so sure that they see and that what they see is what is real. And really what we're talking about is the way that they see is helping them to see accurately. And Jesus is like, just the fact that you're so confident that the way you see is actually what's happening is the problem. It's what makes you actually blind. Yeah. Not in a physical sense, but we're talking about some sort of uh, what we might call spiritual blindness, although I don't even know what that means. So you're saying the confidence that they were able to see mm. clearly yeah. actually prevented them from seeing clearly. I think so. That's a real, that's a real tangled, uh, complex yeah. thought yeah. to sit with. I, I have the same passage, passage Rustin. Just really quickly, I want to read it. This is from, uh, I think, Eugene Peterson's version. So okay. it's, it's, it's fun. It. He said, Jesus then said, I came into the world to bring everything into the clear light of day, mm -hmm. um, making all the distinctions clear so that those who have never seen will see and those who have made, I like this, those who have made a great pretense of seeing will be exposed as yeah. blind. People who've made a pretense of what you're saying, yeah. confidence, a pretense of being able to see will be exposed as blind. Right. Um, some Pharisees overheard him said, does that mean you're calling us blind? Which, by the way, is what Jesus often referred to as the Pharisees at. That yeah. was his critique, is that you're blind, you're blind guides. Blind guides. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jesus said, if you were really blind, you would be blameless. But mm -hmm. since you claim to see everything so well, you're accountable for every fault and failure. Yeah. 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 So it reminds me of this thing I've taught on before. Uh, there's actually a medical condition. Mm. It, I, I may be getting this wrong. Let me look to make sure. Anton Babinski syndrome. You know all about it, right? Well, just from what you've <laughs> shared with me. There's this syndrome. I, I've taught this so long. I need to go look it up and make sure that it's actually true. Because uh, I can't remember where I heard about it. Um, but there's this thing that occurs with people who are physically blind like completely physically blind, mm -hmm. where they will nevertheless believe with all their hearts that they can still see. So much so, and it's, it's uncanny, it's really strange to see. Um, they will describe in great detail, like the room around them, even though they're completely wrong. It's like something is, is working in their brain that allows them to project or imagine what's there when it's not there. And the kind of the layman's, the term for that condition is called blind sight. Mm -hmm. They're actually physically blind, but they believe they can see, and it's, they call it blind sight. And I, I love that when I came across it because it immediately made me think of John 9 and, and Jesus talking about seeing and what it takes to see. And I think uh, the Pharisees, what he's exposing there is some sort of blind sight. Mm -hmm. They think they can see, and Jesus is like, actually, you're completely blind. Mm. Yeah, that's a great that's a great description maybe for overconfident mm. religious people that they're yeah. living by blind sight, you know. Blind sight. Yeah, they think they see, yeah. but and of course we have to always look at ourselves and go, maybe this is describing I, me too often and yeah. I think that's the sober uh, correction in this or orientation yeah. for us is yeah. to say not so fast. Um, things uh, Lately, I've been hearing so many arguments that are say, where people will say, it's just common sense. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't know if I believe in that anymore. Mm. I don't know what common sense is. Like, every, everything that, that makes sense to me has been shaped by something. Mm -hmm. And so when I think, when I hear an argument, I say, oh, that makes sense to me. I always want to take that next step and go, why does that make sense to me? What's, Which is a wise thing to do. Yeah. Why, yeah. Why, why does that, yeah, why does that resonate? Like, what are the things that have informed me that make me think that's common sense where somebody else doesn't think that's yeah. common sense? Because common sense continually evolves and continues to change. It does. Um, and, and humans aren't necessarily born with common sense. So Eugene Peterson told, talked about that. He said that humans are, are the only creatures that are, that are born like completely stupid. 
Like, you know, dogs, I have a dog, you have dogs. Like uh, instinctually. They, they have an instinct, they yeah. know how to survive. They can be born and, and, and kind of make their way, but mm -hmm. a human baby is born, and if you don't completely care for it for several years, it will, it will die. Uh, and, and that goes into adulthood, like everything that is, seems like common sense, uh, almost everything we, that, that, that seems to be true is not true to a yeah. human. Like, example I like to use is it seems like the sun goes across the sky. Mm -hmm. If you just observe it, well, that just is common sure. sense. Sure, yeah. It turns out that's not true. It turns out that's not true. Another one is the, the earth. Um, it, it seems like it's flat. Isn't it? <laughs> I, I know some people who think yeah, it is. Yeah. But that's not true. Yeah. It's not, so it's a blindside thing. It yeah. totally seems like you're seeing it accurately, yeah. but you're not. And that, I just think it's sobering, John. Um, because I, and, and partly because of where I am in my journey. Yeah. There have been so many things I've been wrong about over the years. And if anything else, it calls us to a posture of humility. Uh, you know, Carrie just, she got for me for my birthday the Criterion channel. So I've talked to you yeah. a lot about it because yeah, right. I love... I love movies and I love old movies and, and so I'm just ODing um, on all these. I just told you about a Frank Capra movie I've watched. And just, but one thing that sticks out to me is I watch movies throughout time. Like um, I'm watching movies from the 30s, 40s, 50s and on up. And it, it, it is how inappropriate some things are that were filmed in one decade as opposed to now. Mm -hmm. and, and you think, wow, we've really evolved. Our collective conscience has really evolved as a people. You can't say things now that you could say then. You can't do things now that you can do then. People of color cannot be portrayed in movies the way they were portrayed in the movie I just watched last night, yeah. you know? Yeah. But, but the thing is, now we look at our times that we live in, and um, in our moment in history, it's become aware, uh, or it's become, um, apparent to all of us that um, that you cannot things that were acceptable four years ago mm -hmm. and I'm thinking of Colin Kaepernick in this point mm -hmm. in, in the protesting mm -hmm. uh, at football games are being completely reevaluated now so I just yeah. watched a sports center uh, special on how Colin Kaepernick will get a chance to play for NFL teams yeah. and yeah I mean it's just even even I, I just saw the headline but it sounds like even the president says he should get another chance which the I, president, I, I saw that. I, I saw the clip. I didn't read more because honestly, I, mm -hmm. I don't want to know. But uh, Yeah, because I'm a sports junkie, this yeah. stuff is happening all the time. Drew all Brees time. Yeah. said something about the American flag uh, four years ago right. and, and why he would never kneel or something like yeah. that. And then yeah. and he said the same thing today yeah. and he got lambasted by the media. That's right. All that to say, our yeah. consciousness keeps evolving. So we yeah. have to be really careful before yeah. we say, I see clearly. Yeah. You might well, not, but I do. We're constantly getting new data. Yeah. Uh, we're, if we're growing and maturing, we're also able to see things from other people's mm -hmm. perspective with basic compassion for the powerless, yeah. like you taught us about. Yeah. Um, so those things are growing. I, I heard a thing, I think this is worth saying. Uh, th this person uh, that wrote a book a few years ago, um, I think the title might have been like being wrong or something and in it she poses basically this one question of what does it feel like to be wrong and the answer basically is it feels exactly like being right mm -hmm. <laughs> think about that for a moment yeah, yeah right right when you're wrong you don't know that you're wrong it feels like you're right so how are you supposed to you're it's blindsight there's no feeling that will tell you no yeah no so there has to be some kind of awakening uh, I think I think spirituality helps with that, um, but certainly relationship and mm -hmm. listening and humility. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's in that same book that she talks about three reasons that people don't change, don't shift perspectives, don't learn. One was ignorance. We talked about that last week and confessed that, man, we're all ignorant. I mean, mm -hmm. we, nobody knows everything and we're constantly learning. So when you know better, you do better, mm -hmm. hopefully. Although we can be willfully ignorant and that's a problem. A second thing is stupidity, like, it, <laughs> and it's sad that when I heard that I thought of other people, but the truth is, <laughs> as we all do, I had to have some humility, and sure. I, I remember the time I was trying to read, um, you know how C.S. Lewis writes, and if you read like Mere Christianity, it's not easy sledding, I mean the, the language is a little archaic and, and, and dense, but I, one time I tried to read a C.S. Lewis um, academic paper, 
Okay. Because Mere Christianity was actually written for popular audience. Sure. So it's supposed to be easy. Yeah, it's supposed to be easy. Sure. <laughs> I read an academic paper by C.S. Lewis, and I felt so dumb. Yeah. Like, I just, I couldn't hang with it. Did you make, you didn't make it through the whole um, thing, did you? I might have out of a sense of pride, but, wow. but I don't think I understood it. And I just had to remind myself of that and go, you know, I am a limited person. I'm not going to be the smartest person in, mm -hmm. in the world. That's hard to admit for me because I have some ego about being smart. But I'm not that smart. So ignorance or stupidity can keep you from changing. And then and the third thing was just being malicious. Like, you know, and you're smart enough to know, but you just willfully entrench yourself in ideologies or, or ways of seeing things because you're protecting your interests over against what's good for the other. Yeah. And that, I don't think that's a, as big a problem as it seems, because I think we all accuse everybody of being malicious when in fact, you know, we're just sometimes ignorant and honestly sometimes we're just stupid. Yeah, but it does remind me, well, of like I would say nationalism and militarism and that kind of thing rises from a maliciousness as you just defined yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, because, yeah, and it's rooted sometimes in fear and self-protection and self-interest. It's really good, Rustin. We can make a whole sermon about yeah, what you Yeah, that's another said. teaching at another time. So, I, ignorant, I, what, what were the three things? Uh, ignorant, stupid, or malicious. Yeah, those all keep us from... From changing, from, from seeing changing. accurately yeah, in, from in the context of this conversation. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that. So, we've talked about two different kinds of people, Rustin. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the people that hung out with Jesus, mm -hmm. and that he hung out with and they liked hanging out with him, and, and they're largely known as as sinners mm -hmm. and let's be honest they were drunkards mm -hmm. and they were prostitutes mm -hmm. and they were marginalized people mm -hmm. tax collectors um they were the blind yeah they were the um the afflicted yeah. right yeah health problems things mm -hmm. that put you under social stigma of the day definitely mm -hmm. and we could insinuate that jesus at least is insinuating that these people can see god mm -hmm. And then we've got this other group that we've talked about as the Pharisees, not to come down too hard on them, but they are people who um, had a lot of confidence yeah. that they were right yeah. and that they could see mm -hmm. clearly. So, so you well, look at those two yeah, groups. And I, and I would say, yeah. sorry, just as an addendum to what that confidence meant is that they had an agenda that they wanted to see enacted and that gave them a filter through which they saw everything. And yeah. So they, they had an investment. They needed to see things in a certain way in order to fit what yeah. they hoped was true. Yeah. And what I'm trying to clarify is, is along those lines, what's the difference between these two groups? Mm, okay. and, and so uh, we've already touched on the, the overconfidence, the agenda that mm -hmm. drives you know, yeah. your desire. Um, we, we touched on the ignorance, stupidity, and maliciousness, which <laughs> I, I love that. And um, the other thing I just wanted to... to point out, which is kind of obvious, is that if, if you're the kind of person that loves hearing the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, and if you're the kind of person who's hanging out with Jesus, there's probably a lot of brokenness in your life. Nobody is suggesting that these people are whole or healthy, okay? That's not the issue here. Right. But, but because even more so than today in our society, those people were probably outcast. I mean, if, you, if, if you're living in a socially not acceptable way, today's church, for example, will be pretty gracious to you. Uh, they, they, they might even have a whole service that's designed to attract you. Mm -hmm. um, the religious institutions of Jesus' day did not try to attract people who were socially marginalized or behaviorally mm -hmm. not right. No. Uh, they were the opposite. There was, yeah. there was great... Um, ostracizing mm -hmm. and keeping out yeah. and these people were probably hurt and that probably helped develop their self-image what i'm getting at is the one thing those people had in common is probably they, they, they were not people who probably had a lot of pride a yeah. lot of pride a lot yeah. of like i what we've been saying i am super right and i am super confident and and, and sometimes i think that pride is at the core of our heart and it's really a heart issue. I know in the Bible, the heart is often written as, a, or, or, or portrayed as an organ of perception. We see with our heart, our heart sees. So when we talk about who can see God, it's kind of getting to our heart yeah. and how clean our heart is or not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so 
I mean, that's, I mean, that's all through the scripture, right? Mm -hmm. So, in fact, let me just add the word that Jesus uses for pure, yeah. or that Matthew uses for pure here, is, is the same word that's used for clean. For a clean. Lot. Yeah, clean. That's good. That, that reminds me of what Jesus does later in the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, yeah. Is it okay to jump ahead? Jump ahead. I want to spend more time on this when we get there. Okay. Because uh, it's a favorite thing of mine. Jesus in Matthew 6, um, I've got it here somewhere. Let me look for okay. it. Um, Matthew 6, 22. Uh, Jesus is going to talk about seeing again. and he, That's where he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. Mm, um, yes. Then he says, if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light within you is darkness, how great is the darkness? I don't fully understand that, but I love how he talks in that. Um, what is fascinating to me about this, I, I learned this in seminary, I'd never heard this before. The eye is the lamp of the body. I don't think I ever knew what that meant, but literally they're talking about a lamp like you use to illuminate uh, what you see. Yeah. So in the ancient world, there's this idea they, they didn't understand physiology the way we do. It sounds counterintuitive to what yeah. we would say today. So we would say that light comes into the eye. We know mm -hmm. how an eye works, hopefully from biology class. That the light comes in and it bounces around and it projects mm -hmm. an image and then out. But they thought of the eye as a, a, as a thing that uh, put light out. Like you had light inside your eye and the light shone outward and illuminated the image that you could then bring in and understand. Mm -hmm. So if the lamp your eyes lamp of the body, if the lamp is, doesn't have light, then you're, you're full of darkness. No light is being exchanged. You can't see anything. And in, in this case, you can't see anything accurately. Mm -hmm. So for Jesus, that teaching ends up being about not whether or not you're blind or you can see, but that's the way that you see is an act of generosity or an act of critique and, and condemnation. Mm -hmm. You're either seeing things with a generous eye, full of light, or you're seeing things with darkness. You're yeah. putting darkness on. That's really them. good. It reminds me of what you said about who will see God. Yeah. That some people can look at uh, at the Godfather and see some amazing spiritual message, and other people won't see it. Yeah. We'll see God. Um, yeah. What causes us, I think, to see with generosity, mm -hmm. as you said, and again, I just go back to this: is that humble heart. I feel like this is really a call to humility, mm -hmm. if anything else. Um, it's a great thing for us to remember yeah. that Jesus was not the Messiah that the religious leaders of his day were expecting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. They had a predetermined idea of who he was and what he would look like, and they didn't expect him to be... The list just goes on. They didn't expect him to be lowly born. They didn't expect yeah. him to be a carpenter. They didn't expect him... Uh, to come from a local town. They did not expect him to work outside of their system. Mm -hmm. They had a Messiah that, of course, yeah. he's going to be a yeah. part of the American Christian Church. Yeah. I mean, that's how we would think today. They had something very dangerous, and I would call it certainty. Certainty. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so over, you overconfidence. Say, so, so certainty, overconfidence are things that you would say that uh, cloud the lens Cloud right. Uh, yeah. If we're going back to that, pure is clean. Yeah. And what we're talking about is having a clean lens yeah. through which we see. Yeah. And if you if you're if you're overconfident, it clouds it. Um, it clouds it, mucks it up. They <laughs> knew who the Messiah would be. Mm -hmm. They had it all figured out. They were overconfident with certainty, yeah. and Jesus called them blind. Blind. Blind guides. Yeah. Blind fools. So I think that there's a word of caution in there for all of us today. Uh, the, the moment that we become overly certain that we know yeah. exactly how God moves or we know exactly the way that God wants us to act or behave, we have to be careful, you know. Yeah. And I know, I feel like that's a bonding thing between our churches. If there's anything that defines Beggar's Table is this posture of humility uh, in holding our faith with open hands and mm -hmm. saying, you know, and, and I think that's true at Vox, too. Yeah. And it allows us to get together and have conversations and wrestle with yeah. ideas. And, I hope so. I yeah. mean, it's one of the reasons we chose the name uh, Vox Day, the voice of God, because we want to be people who are listening. Jesus said, my sheep hear my yeah. voice, right? And they, they know me. So 
Um, I mean, that's it. And it's, it's one of the reasons we chose beggars. Well, <laughs> yeah. Similar exactly. reason. Yeah. Same, yeah. A little bit exactly. of humility. Humility. And self-assessment. It is this the most ironic thing. That the most, re- it's not just ironic, it's, uh, it's cautionary. Uh, that the most religious people in Jesus' day were the ones who completely missed seeing him for who yeah. he was. Yeah. I, w- I wonder if it's not true today, too. I, I, so a friend of mine wrote in a book, he wrote, God continues his work in the world through incarnation in the lives of ordinary people who are willing to love and serve others in the name of Christ. Mm-hmm. If we are corrupted by pride and possess a judgmental disposition, we will never be able to see God at work in the lives of flawed human beings. And he reworded this beatitude, blessed are those who have a clean window into their soul, for they will perceive God when and where others don't. When and where others don't. Yeah. A clean window into the soul. What do you think it is that keeps the window clean beyond humility? Does anything come to mind? It's like, what can I do this week <laughs> to, uh, to yeah. practice cleaning the window? Yeah. You know, what comes to mind right now is the whole state of civil unrest mm. that we live in mm. and being able to step out of my uh, white male privileged shoes mm. into some other shoes. And I don't know if that's what you had in mind, but yeah. that's what comes to mind for me. I don't know. I just know I have a desire in me to be one of those who recognizes Jesus and the work of the Spirit Mm -hmm. as it's happening. And uh, I know that I've read the Bible enough to know that just because uh, I'm, you know, paid to be religious (laughs) doesn't doesn't put me in it at an advantage to other people. So I want to pay attention. Mm -hmm. It's good. Yeah. Well, I don't know, Rustin, I thought about closing with this. I, uh, do you have anything yeah. else to say? That... Well, I I'd actually have a great, uh, just one more thing. That okay. Paul picked this up. You know, Paul's just, I, I was, I've been hard on Paul in my life, but I really love him again at this stage of my life. Do you? Yeah, okay. Yeah, because I think he's, if, uh, he's a pastor. And, ah, that's uh, true. And I, I have sympathy for Paul him. Paul sometimes is grumpy and, you know, so am I. Yeah, we all, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, so I get it. I have compassion for him, for yeah. sure. Yeah. But he is always just trying to work out this Jesus life in a real context. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't get to stand on the hill and just say it. He has to like go actually work this out in churches. Yep. So I have a little compassion for the guy. He, he died wrote, young too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah. So he wrote Ephesians, which is my favorite letter of his to the church in Ephesus. And he talked about this whole, um, concept of the eyes and the eyes of the heart that was his phrase the eyes of the heart Mm -hmm. and i think it's him working out this teaching of jesus when he says i pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe Mm. So let me just say that first line again. I that's, pray that, I pray that the great. eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that all that stuff will happen. Mm-hmm. That's a great, that is a great blessing in sending words for us to close it on. It is. Yeah. Yeah, so may that be. May my heart, uh, the eyes of my heart be enlightened. May the window be clean, the lens clean, the lamp be bright, and, and may we go seeing with generous eyes uh, the world before us today. May that be true of all of us. Amen. Amen, John. Amen.